This is Dining Table Print and Play, and today we're going to talk about making boards. We'll start off with some very simple ones, which just involve a bit of tape, and go right the way up to vinyl wrapped, nicely folding boards like you find in a commercial game. The simplest way of making a board is to simply print it out across several sheets of regular paper and stick it together with tape. I like to use a rotary cutter and a steel ruler to cut the board sections out. Check the card for a tips video on rotary cutters. But you could also use a knife or even a pair of scissors. When you cut your board sections, it's important that you identify the joining lines, where you need to cut to make sure that the board lines up on either side of the join. Sometimes this is in the file already, and there's a handy mark to cut to. But if not, you can often simply line one part up over the next, like this, as if they were folded one onto the other, and then see where the graphics from the two boards reach the same position. In this case, it looks like I can make a cut down the side of the one in this 10. An easy way to make sure this cut is square is to use a cutting mat with a square grid on it. Just line the already cut sides of the board up with the vertical lines, and then align your ruler with the horizontal lines when making the cut. When you come to cut this line, it's worth double checking some landmarks on each half of the board to make sure you're cutting in the right place. For example, the top of this tower is in the same place on the part I'm cutting as it is on the other board, so I'm in the right position. Once you've cut the board out, you need to tape the parts together. It's a bit tricky to just line them up and tape them all in one go, so I like to use a couple of bits of masking tape to hold the pieces together before I stick the permanent tape down. Masking tape can easily be repositioned, so it allows me to get everything lined up without any stress. Then we just peel each bit of masking tape off as we stick the permanent tape down. There we have it, a taped together paper board. This one sits flat enough on the table to play with, but if yours doesn't, there's a simple trick that wargamers with their folded paper maps have been using for years. Just disassemble a picture frame and use the transparent glass or acrylic from the picture frame to keep the board flat. Try and look for one which has acrylic in because it's much safer, they're often labelled as plastic glass or something like that. If you'd like your boards to stay flat on their own, then the easiest option is to just glue some stiff card behind the printed board. Here I'm using a 480 GSM art card, but you could also use thicker grey board, mounting board etc for a more sturdy board. In this case I've printed out the board graphics on a good quality full sheet label, and sprayed it with a coat of acrylic lacquer to protect the printing. You could also cover the board with a cold laminate film at this point if you wanted to protect it further. Since this board fits on a single sheet of paper and I've printed it on a label, it's easy enough to just stick the label down to the stiff card. When sticking down labels, it's easiest to peel back just a little bit of the backing at one end, so you can then slide it around on top of the card substrate and get it positioned correctly. Once it's in the right place, just dab the label down onto the card at one end, and then you can start to pull the backing out from behind it gradually and smooth the label down to the card all the way across. If you need a bit of help smoothing the label down evenly, you can slide a cork-backed ruler across it to apply an even pressure. At this point you could simply use the board as is, it's pretty much good to go. I'm going to trim this one all the way around to make a tidier edge. As before, use the square grid on the cutting mat to line up square cuts to keep every corner at 90 degrees. Now, this method works fine for small boards like this, but most games have larger boards and that's going to be a problem. You'll probably find the card, but labels and printers at this kind of size are hard to come by. Not to mention that this small board will fit in a box, but carrying around a huge board in one piece is a little bit unwieldy. To address this, next we'll look at folding boards. Before we start, let's have a look at this small model of what we're going to build. Here's our board, laid flat on the table, and if we pick it up we can fold it into quarters, which means it'll fit into a much smaller space. The board is constructed with one hinge on the back here, which allows it to fold outwards, and you can see here on the front that the game's artwork is split across this hinge. There's also two hinges inside, underneath the artwork, which allow these two quadrants to fold up. To achieve this, the artwork for the game is divided into two pieces, one here and one here. You could extend the same method to produce a six-fold board by adding another couple of folds here and here, and if you plan to do that, I recommend you build a model of your own to make sure that you know where to put each hinge before cutting anything. I'm going to build this board for Dune the Dice Game by Heiko Gunther, so I've printed out one half of the board on each piece of paper, as seen in our model. Again, this is printed on good quality label paper and spray lacquered for protection. 
I'm using the same stiff art card as before, which is perfectly sufficient for a small board like this. I'm using my rotary cutter and steel ruler again for the cuts. You could use a knife, but scissors are pretty much out for thicker card. To make the hinges, I'm using tape. For the underside hinges, I'm using book binding tape. And for the top hinges, the ones which will be underneath the artwork, I'm using a sturdy double-sided tape. If you have a proper cloth book binding tape, then you could always use that for all the hinges, but the binding tape I have is plasticised and the labels won't stick to it at all. The first thing I'm going to do is to trim my two pieces of board artwork to size. If you wanted to protect your board further with a layer of cold laminate, you'd put that on at this stage, before we do any further cutting or gluing. Now I've got my artwork cut out, and the pieces line up decently. I have to measure how large the bits of card I'm mounting it to need to be. Width-wise, each strip is 136mm, and lengthwise, 272mm. In this case, the board is a perfect square, so the bits of card I need, remember, if the board is cut into quarters, will be 136mm square. If your board isn't square, then remember that each quarter needs to be half the length of the board by half the width of the board. I'm just marking off my measurements by making a little nick in the card with the knife. Then I'll use those nicks to line up the ruler to cut out my squares. So these pieces are going to make up our board, and these will just glue down on top of them, like so. The first task in putting it all together is to make the internal hinges. For each one I'm going to cut a strip of double sided tape that's a little bit wider than the boards and stick it across the gap. You could use masking tape again, but now we're using card I actually find it a bit easier to tape to one half, flip it over, and then lay the other half down onto the tape, lining the edge up as I go. Once the tape is in place, I can just run the knife down the edge to trim the excess. Next, we peel back one end of the label, line it up using the backing, and damp the end down to hold it in place before smoothing the label down. Remember to stop just before we hit the double-sided tape at the hinge, so that we can remove the backing for that tape before sticking the label down to it. If there are any slivers of card showing along the join, place the steel ruler down and trim them to make a nice clean joining edge. This may seem like a bit of a backward way of doing it, and you may find it easier to start with larger bits of card and label than you need, and trim them down after you've made the board sections, or even after you've made the whole board. Personally though, I find it much easier to line up the centre of the board with the fold, like this. Here's what our board will look like once it's done. Now we just have to add the one hinge underneath the board. It would be a bit tricky to cut, cut the binding tape right off the reel perfectly, so I'm going to cut it longer than I need, and lay it gently on the cutting board to trim it to size. As long as you keep your ruler on the waist ends, unlike every other time you use a ruler to cut, then you can avoid sticking the tape down too firmly and it'll come off easily. I'll use the same method for this outside hinge as I did for the tape on the inside hinges. And then the board is complete. We have a nice little board that will fold up into a neat square for easy storage. Next, we'll look at making a high quality vinyl wrapped board like those you find in commercially produced games. For this, I'm going to use a roll of self-adhesive black vinyl with a leather effect texture. This is by a company called DC Fix, who sell it as part of a range of home decor products. So far as I can tell, it's intended for refacing kitchen cabinets or lining drawer bottoms or something. It's very good for board games though, it's flexible, self-adhesive, and very easy to cut and work with. I'm also using a big sheet of 2mm grey board. I want this to be a properly sturdy board when it's done. And I've had my board artwork printed at a professional poster printing company, also on self-adhesive vinyl. Poster printers are a good source of board game prints, even if you print on regular poster paper and glue it yourself, they're still often a good way to get large quality print jobs done. As you can see it's a little uncooperative. This is the board for Dark Star by Claude Thomas. You'll need to make sure your grey board is large enough to mount it of course, so the first thing I'll do is measure how large I need the board to be. I've measured it, and this particular board is 360mm wide, and 534 millimetres across. So I need to divide that by 2 to get 180 millimetres by 267 millimetres. Now that's the size each board quadrant would need to be if I wanted them to run from exactly the centre of the board to exactly the corner of the printed area. However, I need a few millimetres of board all the way around, so I'll add 4 millimetres to each of those to get 184 by 271 millimetres for each quadrant. This gives us space for the vinyl wrap to fold around the edge, 
and ensures that the board artwork doesn't easily catch on things and peel up. Next I'll cut the four board quadrants in the same way as I did for the simpler quadfold board. This is very thick grey board and I want to avoid the ruler slipping, so I'll make several light passes with the rotary cutter. On the last quadrant I actually cut one dimension ever so slightly shorter. Rather than 184mm, it's only 183mm wide. This leaves a tiny gap between this board and the next, and these will be the ones that fold down with no hinge between them. With this gap, they won't rub against each other and potentially damage the board or make it not sit flat. I've marked this one with a cross so I know which one it is. Now we can see how large the board will actually be when it's done. In this case, I have a box in mind for this game already, so I'm just going to check that the boards fit before I go any further. As it happens, they're a little bit long, so I'll cut a millimetre off the long dimension of every board. Now the board quadrants are prepared, it's time to apply the vinyl wrap. This is the black leather effect vinyl that covers the edges and the back of the board. If you want to reinforce the back hinges with double sided tape you can do it at this stage, although in my experience the vinyl is perfectly strong enough on its own. The easiest way to wrap the board is to cut one large piece of wrap that fits the entire board at once, and then cut the wrapped board into sections afterwards. So I'll measure out enough vinyl to cover the entire back of the board, plus leave a couple of centimetres margin on each side to fold around to the front. We'll stick the wrap down as if it were a giant label, peel back a bit of the backing at one end, position the boards in place and then press the stick. The adhesive on the vinyl is pressure sensitive, so while it will still grab a bit if you lay a board down, it won't stick permanently until you apply pressure. It doesn't matter exactly how wide the margin is, the important thing is that the boards all fit, so I'll lay them all down and use that to measure where to start. It's a good idea to use an index card or something to shim a tiny gap between each pair of boards to make sure that even if you stretch the vinyl a little bit while you're applying it, it won't cause the board to cup when it reverts to its normal shape later. These last two boards are the ones with the larger gap that we cut earlier, so don't bother with shims between these, just line them up with the outside edge in both cases and the gap will be preserved. Before we fold the corners of the wrap around, we have to cut a notch into each corner. This ensures that none of the vinyl sticks to the rear glue covered face of other vinyl. If it did, it would prevent that other vinyl from sticking down properly and the corners would stay loose. And this can all be done freehand. First, cut a line outward a few millimetres that just continues the edge of the board. Then a few millimetres away from the edge, at least as far away as the board is thick, cut a slight angle, like so. This means that when the vinyl is folded up and over the top of the board, it doesn't hang out over the edge where it would be easy to catch and lift off. Once all the notches are cut, carefully pull each overhanging side up and around and stick down to the top. You want to try and get it as, as tight as possible, but don't pull the vinyl so much that it stretches if you can avoid it. You'll see wrinkles appear on the top, but just smooth them down, they'll be fine. Now we have that vinyl wrap on all the way around, we actually need to cut this in half. If we look at our model, our board will be this way around. These legs where we left the gap are going to fold up, and this join will fold back that way. Because these two hinges will fold up, the back side needs to be cut in order to allow that fold to happen. So I need to cut this board in half this way before sticking the artwork on. I'm just going to use the craft knife for this and follow the gap between the boards with the blade. I'll also need to carefully cut just the top side of the wrap on this join to allow it to fold backwards. Because these two legs will fold independently, these two need to be separated. Remember there's a bit more of a gap here so I'll run the knife down one side and then the other to clean up the excess vinyl. The internal hinges are made the same way as the previous board, but this time we're cutting the double sided tape a little short so that it doesn't show after the artwork is stuck down. Again, these joints are shimmed with index cards. Now our board folds correctly and it just needs artwork. You probably won't have this much trouble if you're not using rolled up vinyl for your artwork. We need to trim off every edge and then cut it exactly down the middle. Finally, we apply the artwork to the board. As before, remove a bit of the backing, align everything, then stick the edge down and work forward from there. Remember to remove the backing from the double sided tape before you cover it up.
When applying the second half, the most important thing is that the artwork lines up neatly. If this is askew, it will be more noticeable than if the margin isn't exactly the same on both sides. Finally we're done! And we're left with a nice folding board with a vinyl wrap around the back and artwork mounted nicely across the front. So there we have it, three different ways to make boards for your print and play games, ranging from the relatively cheap and simple, right the way up to the more expensive and significantly more spiffy. Regardless of whether you're just trying to try a game out, or make something significantly more special to last you a long time or give us a gift or something, there's plenty of options. Have fun.